Okay, hi everybody, Shalom, thank you for coming. Uh, first, I want to announce our dedications for tonight. Uh, the Aliyat Neshama of Ben Yamin Yisrael Ben Shlomo Halevi. Uh, that's someone that we've been praying for for a very long time, and unfortunately he succumbed, and Be'ezer Hashem, he should have an Aliyat Neshama. I also want to wish his parents, the Ganchers, who are suffering from COVID, that they should have a Refua Shlema. Uh, in addition, Yoel Ben Avraham, and then I have uh, two dedications from Avrami Fine, who is, happens to be a friend of mine in New York, who himself uh, gives many, many shiurim in Chumash and the like. And uh, the first dedication of, from Avrami is Lezecher Nishmas, his grandmother, uh, Malka Bas Avram Yitzchak, Allah Shalom. And uh, the second dedication is Refua Shlema for Yosef Zundel Bas Devore Esther. And then we have uh, Refua Shlema for Braya Bat Chava, and all of these cholim should have a Refua Betoch Shar Chole Yisrael. Um, there are really two things I want to talk about tonight. Uh, one is looking at the past, and one is looking a little bit forward to the future, short-term future, tomorrow. I want to talk about uh, what we celebrated on Sunday, and there actually was a holiday on Sunday that perhaps uh, you didn't notice called Pesach Sheni, and then uh, tomorrow night, uh, Thursday, we're going to have the great holiday of Lag Ba'omer, uh, the 33rd day of the Omer. Lag is simply uh, th uh, 33, and uh, we will discuss what the significance of these holidays are. Neither of these dates are Yomim Tovim in terms of a Doraisa sense, but they are very, very festive cases. First, let me talk a little bit about Pesach Sheni because even though it's already passed, it has such an important message that it's something we need to internalize. Uh, what is the story of Pesach Sheni? The Korban Pesach is, of course, brought on the 14th of Nisan, and it is eaten the night of the 15th of Nisan when we have the Seder. At the time of the very first Korban Pesach in the desert, which actually was the second Korban Pesach, the first was in Egypt, but the first one they brought in the desert, there were people who were ritually impure. They were tame. They were contaminated by contact with the dead. And as a result, they were not halachically permitted to bring the Korban Pesach. They went to Moshe Rabbeinu and they complained and they said, why should we be deprived of a chance to bring the sacrifice of God? Now, question number one, why were these people tummy? What uh, made them impure? What dead bodies were they in contact with? So there actually is a machlokas in the Gemara, an argument in the Gemara, why were these people tummy? According to one view, it was the rotation to carry Yosef's bones. Remember, Yosef's bones were transported for the 40 years in the desert. And the people who transported it, there was a rotation. So it happened to be that these people, their turn was to transport Yosef's bones. The time of the Korban Pesach. So that made them Tameh, right? You carry a dead body, you are Tameh for seven days. There is another view that these were the Levim who had to retrieve the dead body of Nadav and Aviyu. When the Mishkan was dedicated, Aaron's two oldest children, Nadav and Aviyu, uh, brought incense in an improper way, and a fire came from Hashem and killed them, and their bodies are in the Mishkan, and those bodies had to be retrieved. So we're told that Nadav and Aviyu's cousins retrieved those bodies. The problem is that makes you tame, and therefore they were unable to bring the Korban Pesach. Bein kach bein kach, whatever the reason was, whether they were tame because they were carrying the bones of Yosef, or whether they were tame because they had carried the bodies of Nadav and Aviyu, they were not able to bring the Korban Pesach. So they went to Moshe and they said, Lama nigara, why should we be deprived 
of bringing the Korban Pesach. Moshe didn't know the answer. Moshe asked Hashem, what happens when somebody is ritually impure and they can't bring the Korban Pesach? And God created a new mitzvah, I'll discuss what that actually means. And God said, ah, if somebody is ritually tame at the time of the Korban Pesach, and then God added another, another stipulation, or somebody is far away, which will be activated, of course, in the, in the, in the desert, nobody's far away from the Mishkan. The Mishkan's right there, but when the Jews eventually settle, there'll be people very far from Jerusalem who won't be able to make it for Pesach. So either if you're tame, or your derech rechoka, that term does need some definition, so you can bring the Korban Pesach exactly one month later. If the original Korban Pesach is the 14th of Nisan, the ability to make up is on the 14th of Eeyore, which was Sunday, and that is called Pesach Sheni. Now, Pesach Sheni is very different than Pesach Rishon. Number one, Pesach Rishon is a holiday for seven days, and you're not allowed to have chametz, leavened bread. Pesach Sheni is only the 14th of Nis of Eor, and they would eat the korban that night, the 15th of Eor, and they would eat it with matzah and maror, but you're, they were allowed to have chametz in their house. They didn't have to get rid of any chametz. This is Pesach Sheni. So first of all, Analytically speaking, uh, the whole idea of Pesach Sheni seems to contradict the way we understand the way Hashem gave the Torah to Moshe. Pirkei Avos says, in the very beginning, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. God gave Moshe in the 40 days he was at Har Sinai, both the first time and the second time, all of these 613 mitzvahs. Moshe knew received from God all of the 613 mitzvahs. Now, Pesach Sheni is one of the 613 mitzvahs. So, how could Moshe not know that? He had already been at Mount Sinai and God had given him the mitzvah. In fact, there are four places in the Torah where Moshe didn't know the halacha and he had to ask Hashem. One was the guy who gathered wood on Shabbos, and he transgressed the malacha, Moshe didn't know what the penalty for that is. He had to ask God, and God said, one who desecrates Shabbos with the requisite warnings gets stoned. That's the makoshesh. The second was the blasphemer, the one that is the child of a Jewish mother and an Egyptian father, so he's Jewish. He cursed God, blasphemy, Moshe didn't know the punishment. He has to ask God. Once again, the punishment is stoning. The third case where Moshe didn't know is Pesach Sheni, where the people who were Tame came to him and said, what do we do? Moshe didn't know. He asked Hashem. Hashem said they could bring it one month later. The fourth we're going to read later, and this is the daughters of Tzalafchad. Tzalafchad was a man of the tribe of Menashe who died in the desert. He had no sons. And the question is, who is going to inherit his portion in the land of Israel? His brothers maintained that when there are sons, they inherit. But when there are no sons, it goes to the brothers. So they should have the right of inheritance. The daughters maintained that when there are no sons, daughters inherit like sons. And it doesn't go to the brothers. Moshe didn't know. Moshe asked God. And God said, when there are no sons, daughters have equal inheritance rights. So these are four situations where Moshe did not know the halacha. The punishment for the Shabbos desecrator, the punishment for the blasphemer, the law of Pesach Sheni, and the law of Yerusha, inheritance of daughters, the daughters of Selevchah. Now, my question is a very simple question on all four of those cases. If Chazal understands that Moshe was given all of the mitzvot of the Torah at Mount Sinai, then how could it be he didn't know? Uh, you know, this, the death penalty for Chilul Shabbos and for blasphemy, 
is one of the commandments. Pesach Sheni is one of the commandments. Benos Salafchad is one of the commandments. So what didn't he know? So there are various midrashim that Avada Moshe knew, but he had forgotten because of anger. Chazal derived from various points that Moshe lost his temper. And there is a well-known rabbinic teaching that he who is angry will lose his wisdom. Okay. But the Chazonish gives a very, very nice pshat, which is really uh, very meaningful in terms of the structure of the Torah. The Chazonish points out that although Moshe was given all of the mitzvahs of the Torah in the 40 days at Mount Sinai, the Jewish people didn't get them right away. If you read the Chumash, you constantly see that the Jewish people are getting mitzvahs in dribs and drabs over a 40-year period. We did not have all of the mitzvahs till the very day that Moshe Rabbeinu died. There are many commandments in the book of Deuteronomy, which is the last month of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, that are not even mentioned in the Torah before that. The mitzvah of get, you know, divorce, yibum. Our assumption is Hashem told Moshe that mitzvah at Sinai, but he was not authorized to reveal it until various occasions. Now, why that's so is a fascinating question, and you actually have to go through every individual mitzvah. But you have to differentiate between when did Moshe get the mitzvah and when did B'nai Yisrael get the mitzvah. B'nai Yisrael did not get the Torah at one time. B'nai Yisrael got mitzvahs over a period of 40 years. Okay, it's a very, very important idea. Uh, and that's not a contradiction to Moshe Kibel Torah Misenai, because the Kibel Torah Misenai is when did Moshe get the mitzvah? And that is even the meaning of perhaps the most ubiquitous pasuk in the Torah. Vayedaber Hashem El Moshe Lamar. So the English translates it. God spoke to Moshe saying. Well, the saying is just a superfluous word. You don't need it. But Lamar actually means to say it to other people. Meaning God is telling Moshe the commandments that I gave you at Sinai, you're now authorized to communicate them to Bnei Israel. I'm giving you the green light. So now the Chazanish says, it's very Pashat, why Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't know what to do. Moshe Rabbeinu knows from Sinai that a Machal Shabbos gets stoned. Moshe Rabbeinu knows from Sinai that a blasphemer gets stoned. Moshe Rabbeinu knows from Sinai that a person who's Tameh can bring Pesach Sheni. And Moshe Rabbeinu knows from Sinai that daughters inherit. But he was not yet authorized to tell the Jewish people those questions. So Moshe Rabbeinu is uncertain, kind of acting on the basis of inside information. Am I allowed to make halachic rulings based on what I was told when I was not yet told to reveal it to the cloud. So he asks Hashem, and Hashem says, now is the time to reveal it. In other words, it's the green light. So it's not that Moshe was ignorant of a halacha, but rather Moshe was uncertain how he could proceed if he had not yet been given the lamor of that particular mitzvah. And obviously what's going on here is, it is God's will that certain mitzvahs be revealed to the Jewish people through certain historical occurrences. Okay, so now the Chidushi Arim points out a very beautiful lesson of Pesach Sheni. The Korban Pesach is one of the strongest symbols of our relationship with God. It's a repudiation of idolatry. It's an affirmation of emuna. It expresses gratitude for Hashem passing over the houses of the Egyptians. It's a very strong sign of the unique relationship we have with God. But sometimes a person feels they are unworthy of that type of relationship. They feel impure. They feel besmirched. They feel contaminated. Or they feel they are bederech rechoka. 
They are so far away from God that they have no way of getting back in track. Elisha ben Avoye was that way. Elisha ben Avoye was a great, great rabbi who became a heretic. He became an apicorus. Why that's so is, again, a complicated story. There's actually a historical novel about him as a driven leaf, written by a very famous conservative rabbi, Milton Steinberg, which kind of explores psychologically the conflicts of this complicated man, Elisha ben Aboya. I'm not suggesting it's an authentic source or anything, but it goes to different possibilities. And he had a very devoted disciple who was a great, great rabbi, Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir continued to learn from Abisha ben Avoya, even after Elisha ben Avoya was a heretic. And when people said to Rabbi Meir, how can you learn from such an apicorus? Rabbi Meir said, I look at him like a pomegranate. I throw away the inedible peel and I eat the good seeds. I separate myself from the bad part and I take the good part. People sometimes use that as a justification to take uh, Jewish studies courses at universities where there's a lot of apicorus, a lot of kefira, but they say, ah, oh, I'll, I'll be like Rav Meir, I'll take the good and get rid of the bad. The problem is, most of us are not as great as, I mean, most of us, none of us, are as great as Rabbi Meir, so it's hard to take the chance there. Okay. At various points, Rabbi Meir turned to his Rebbe and he said, you know so much Torah. You're so learned. Why can't you do tshuva? And Elisha ben Aboya said, I heard a voice from heaven that said, let my wayward children return except for this man because he's beyond the point of return. Rav Soloveitchik used to say that this so-called voice from heaven was not a heavenly voice. It was Elisha ben Aboya, who's called Acher, the other one. It was a voice within him that told him he's too far gone. In fact, the gates of tshuva are never closed. But sometimes we have a perception. We're too far away. So what is the lesson of Pesach Sheini? No matter how Tameh you are, no matter how far you think you are from Hashem, there is the gift of a second chance. There is a gift of the ability to come back. Pesach Sheini says, hope is never lost. There's always the chance to come back. So that's a very, very important lesson for us in our lives. But the Chidush Harim says, there's a second lesson. Because keep in mind that the mitzvah of Pesach Sheini was given only because people went to Moshe and they complained about it. Now, you may wonder, why are they complaining? After all, they're legitimately exempt. I mean, they were doing a mitzvah. They're tummy. I mean, imagine if, you know, people go crazy, they clean for pay. Imagine if you got a letter from God. Signed, sealed, authenticated, that it is from God. It's not a fake letter. That says, you don't have to clean for Pesach this year. Are we going to say, no, 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 why should I be deprived of a mitzvah? If, we're, if, we get a, if we get a valid exemption, we run with it. Why were they complaining? And the answer is, when you truly love God, you look for opportunities to serve Him. You relish those opportunities. It pains you not to have that chance. So, says the Chidush Arim. On one hand, the message of Pesach Sheni is the gift of a second chance, no matter how far you are. But there's a condition. You have to want it enough to ask. You have to care enough that you feel there's something missing in your life. If they didn't care, then God wouldn't care. God wouldn't give them a second chance had they not asked for it. But they cared enough to ask. God cares enough to give. 
Right? So those are the two great lessons of Pesach Sheni. Never give up hope and ask Hashem. Did you say earlier that the mitzvah had to come about? It was just a question of... Yeah, well, again, uh, it would have come about, but, but these individual people would not have been the media for the mitzvah. So they wouldn't, right? Now, Hashem would have given it whenever Hashem would give it. Maybe he'd have to wait for a future generation. It wouldn't have been given to them. They would not have been given a second chance. In other words, had they not complained to Moshe, Hashem wouldn't have said, oh, the people who are Tomei should bring the Korban. They just would have lost out. Okay, so Eina Chinami, I think it is true that the mitzvah somehow would have come out, but not, not for them, at least. Right? So these are the two lessons of Pesach Sheni, the gift of the second chance, and all you need to do is ask. You don't ask, you don't get. Actually, that's what uh, they sometimes say in Mir. You know, Mir is a gigantic yeshiva, like 7,000 Talmidim. And sometimes uh, students get, Talmidim get lost. because It's hard to have a connection with the Rebbe if your shir has 200 people in it, or whatever it is. So Rav Nachem, part of it, Zechariah Lebracha, was one of the great, great Rosh Hashivas of Mir, once said, in Mir, we don't give, you have to take, meaning you have to ask. If you ask, you'll find. If you don't ask, you, know, uh, you might not be noticed and the like. So there is a kind of a similar dynamic. Kalape HaKadosh Baruch Okay, so that's what I wanted to share with you about Pesach Sheni. Uh, it's already passed, but it's something to, to think about. Now, the holiday that's coming up is the 33rd day of the Omer. And this is actually the third share in a row that on Sphiros Omer. So we kind of stretched it out in a lot of ways. And the 33rd day of the Omer is a festive day in various ways. Uh, many people go to Meiron and we'll discuss why. Last year, of course, everyone remembers that in Meiron there was a, a devastating tragedy of more than 40 people who were trampled to death. And we still mourn them, and we think about them, and uh, we pray, and Hashem should give them uh, much, much reward in Olam Haba. Uh, but this year, they still are planning the big crowds to Meiron, and uh, obviously they've improved a lot of the safety conditions. So Be'ez Ras Hashem, uh, there should only be uh, good health. No one should be injured in going to Meiron. But the question is, what is the joy of Lagba Omer? Why is Lagba Omer a festive day. Why is it a joyous day? Now, granted, the magnitude of the joy may differ from person to person. I think Rechaim Kinevsky said, the only thing we do on Lag Baomer is not say Tachanan. <laughs> okay, but even that is at least an external little sign that it's a happy day, even if you're not doing anything. I don't say Tachanan. Okay, but obviously many people do much more than that. So what's interesting is, that the festiveness of Lav Glag Baomer has two different reasons which are almost opposites. We already spoke last week and some weeks before that, that during the period of Sviras Omer, which is a preparation for Matan Torah, the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died. Tremendous loss. And we mourn their deaths by not getting haircuts, by not getting married. Later, Minhagim include not listening to music. Uh, and we talked last week that the different configurations, different customs, how many days do you observe? But according to our tradition, on the day of Lag Baomer, the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying. Now, depending on the Minhagim, either Lag Baomer was a break and they continued to die afterwards. Or according to some understandings, Lag Baomer, they stopped dying, meaning there were no deaths on Lag Baomer. So whether Lag Baomer is mamash the end, or whether Lag Baomer is a hiatus or a break, depends on the Minhagim. But the celebration of Lag Baomer is, this was the day. <coughs> that the students of Rabbi Akiva did not die. I'll come back to that. The second reason for Lagba Omer 
is because it is the day that a later student of Rabbi Akiva did die. It's a little peculiar. <laughs> we're, we're rejoicing because deaths didn't occur. And we're rejoicing because a death did occur. And this is the death of a later disciple, a later disciple of Rabbi Akiva, who is called Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And it is said that Lag Omer was the day of his death. Now, why would that be a happy occasion? Right? The death of a tzaddik is a sad occasion. It's a happy occasion because it is said on the day of his death, he revealed a great light to the world, the mystical light of teachings that are in the Zohar. He is said to be the author of the Zohar. Again, uh, that's also a question exactly what that means. It certainly does not mean he wrote every single word in the Zohar. There are many passages of the Zohar that are later than Rabbi Shem Rabbi Yechai, but it does mean that the core of the mystical ideas in the Zohar are from Rabbi Shem and Yochai. And therefore, the day of his death was the day of a great revelation of wisdom and holiness to the world that until then was inaccessible and unknown. The connection to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is why people go to Meiron. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried in Meiron with his son, Rabbi Elazar Rabbi Shema. And the pilgrimage of hundreds of thousands of people to Meiron is based on the connection of Lag Omer to the death, to the yard site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now I just want to point out that the idea that Lag Omer is the yard site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, how do we know that? What's the source for that? Well, it's, it's very interesting. The source is a passage in the Kisve Ha'ari, the Arizal's writings. And uh, you need to know that the Ari himself wrote very little. When we talk about Kisve Ha'ari, we are actually talking about Rabbi Chaim Vital. Rabbi Chaim Vital was the Ari's primary Talmud. And virtually every teaching we have from the Arizal, we know only through Rabbi Chaim Vital. So he was, to use a secular example, he was the Boswell to Samuel Johnson, right? Who kind of wrote down, Boswell wrote down everything Samuel Johnson said. Lahavdil Meya Vialuf Abdalas. Rav Chaim Vital wrote down everything the Arizal said. The Arizal died very young. Arizal died. 39. Rav Chaim Vital, I believe, was a little older. I think Rav Chaim Vital, I believe, was 41 when the Arizal died. So um, the Ari was actually younger than Rav Chaim Vital, but Rav Chaim Vital was Mavatal himself. He nullified himself uh, to the Arizal. Now, here's an interesting historical issue. In the Kisve Ari that we have, it describes the joy of Lagba Omer as Yom Shemes, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Yom Shemes, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And that's the source that this was his yard site. However, some historians have pointed out in the earliest manuscripts of Kisve Harizal, it does not say Yom Shemes Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rather, there's an extra letter Yom Simchas. A ches there. Shemes is Shin Mem Sof. Simchas is Shin or Sin Mem Ches. Stuff, which means the day of the rejoicing of Rabbi Shimon Recha. Now, that's an ambiguous phrase. Presumably that means the day that he taught the Zohar, but it doesn't say he died that day. Only in later manuscripts, the Ches dropped out, so it reads Yom Shemes. So some have posited that this was a printing error or a scribal error, and in fact there is no authoritative source. That the Ariza, that the Shimru Yochai died on Lag Baomer. But nevertheless, the Minog Yisrael has been Makabel, that that is his yard site. And even if it's not his yard site, it is still called Yom Simchas, the day that he revealed the Zohar. So that's simply you're going to have 
Anyway, by the way, as a little aside, a, a much, much, much later Gadol also died in Lag Baomer, and that's none other than the Rama. The Rama is the preeminent posek for all Ashkenazic Jewry. Right? Rav Yosef Kara wrote the Shulchan Aruch, and those are the Pesachim for Sfardim, and the Rama added glasses for Ashkenazim. He died, and also a young man, he died, like, I think, 42, on Lag Ba'imer, and the Ramah's shul is still a functioning Beit Knesset in Krakow. The, the Ramah was the Rav of Krakow, and he too died on Lag Ba'imer. Okay. So we have these two different ideas of Lag Ba'imer. One is the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying, and the other is the death of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the revelation of the Zohar. I want to suggest that these two different aspects of Lag Omer mirror two general aspects of Sviras Omer, And they bring out opposite ideas that need to be reconciled. Let's first talk about the aspect that Lag Omer was the day that the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying. Now we know and we talked about this last week at length, that we're not just mourning a tragedy. Because if that's all it would be, we've had worse tragedies. Why don't you mourn the Holocaust? Rather, Chazal tell us that the students of Rabbi Akiva died because they didn't show proper honor and respect to each other. And as our first points out, this does not refer to etiquette. But kavod means you see the significance of a person. They didn't see the significance of their chaverim, perhaps because they were connected to their rebbe. They were connected vertically to such a great person, they didn't really see the chashivas of each other. So they died, not even as a punishment, but they died because the mantle of Torah leadership can only rest on Gedolim who see the worth and the value of every Jew. If one does not see the worth and the value of every Jew, you can't be the leader. You can't be the Gadol. The students of Rabbi Akiva were the next generation of Gedolim. God says, you can't lead my people if you don't have faith in my people. If you don't see their goodness, you don't see their greatness. They were taken from the world. And that's why it's brought down that when we commemorate their deaths, we're not just mourning, but we have to resolve in our own lives to see the good in others, see the kavod. Kavod, of her says, means like heaviness, see the weightiness, the significance, the gravitas. Kavod and kaved is the same, uh, same sheirish. So, what happened on Lag Baomer that the plague stopped? Why did it stop on Lag Baomer? By the way, people always ask Akasha, if Rabbi Kiva lost all of his students, then if it stopped on Lag Baomer, that's because nobody was left. So <laughs> what are you celebrating? The plague stopped because everybody was gone. So the answer has to be that not everybody was killed. I mean, that's exactly it. There were 24,000 students. They were dying until Lag Baomer. There were still Talmidim around. They didn't die on Lag Baomer. And according to uh, one minute, they didn't die after Lag Baomer. Meaning, it doesn't say everybody died. Or, well, it does say Kulan, but you could say Kulan means they, 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 all of them were in, in the process of dying. Okay. So here, why was Lag Baomer the divine day where the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying? It needs to be understood in a Kabbalistic way. We know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu interacts in the, with the world to the medium of what Kabbalah calls the Ten Spheros, the Ten Divine Emanations. These are certain divine energies that manifest themselves in how the world is run. 
And God is always balancing and harmonizing these different opposing forces. The first three spheros, though, are called God's brains. They're kind of God's internal deliberations. And we don't know much about them, and we don't even talk much about them. The first three spheros, Keser, the, the ultimate crown of God, Chachma, wisdom, Bina, understanding, that are called Gimel Rishonos. The Gimel Rishonos, we don't talk about. But the lower seven are more behavioral and emotional, and we feel them in the way God runs the world. And I'll just enumerate them. Chesed is loving kindness. Gavura is strength. Tiferes is beauty. Netzach is either victory or endurance or eternity. Hod is glory. Yesod is foundation. I'll try to explain a little bit of them. And the last one is Malchus, kingship. And these are different attributes. So for example, Chesed is the impulse of giving and benevolence. Gavura is the Midas Hadin in the world. Tiferes is the harmonization of Chesed and Gavura, etc. So these are the seven spheros, which are seven channels of divine energy that comes into the world. It is said by the Makubalan that every week of Svira Saomer corresponds to one of the lower seven spheros. So week one of Svira Saomer, which is Pesach, of course, right, is the week of Chesed, loving kindness. Week two of Svira Saomer is inner strength and discipline. Week three is beauty, Tiferes, the harmonization of Chesed and Gevorah. Week four is eternity. I'll try to explain what that is. Week five is Ahod, glory. Week six is Yisod, foundation. Week seven is Malchus. But not only that, given the fact that every week has seven days, the same way each week corresponds to one of the seven spheros, each day within the week corresponds to one of the seven spheros as well. And you can even see this in a sitter. So for example, the first day of the counting of the Omer, which is the second day of Pesach, is called Chesed Sheba Chesed. The day of loving kindness within the week of loving kindness. Chesed Sheba Chesed. The second day of the Omer, third day of Pesach, is called Gevura Sheba Chesed. The inner strength that is within the Chesed. Which should not be confused with the first day of the second week, which is called Chesed Shebi Gvura. Right? There's a week and a day axis of identification. Now it gets complicated to understand. You know, we can understand that maybe the spheros as isolated entities, but when you're dealing with combining them with the other ones, what does it mean? But there are actually books and Sviras Omer spiritual calendars that use this formula of the spheros and it actually gives you an assignment for every day of the Omer, something to work on. Because the basic concept of spheros is Hashem mimics what we do. We determine the flow of energy by what we do. This is a famous word from the Baal Shem Tov. David HaMelech says, Hashem Tzilcha. Hashem is your shadow. So what does that mean? Your shadow goes wherever you go. I move my hands, my shadow moves with me. God shadows you. You behave with compassion. You bring compassion into the world. You behave with din, you bring din into the world. 
So, Sviras Omer, every week, we want to bring in a particular divine energy. So let's talk about this. So week one, I emphasize rachamim and compassion because I want to bring chesed into the world. Week two, I emphasize discipline and introspection because the world needs midas hadin as well. Not in the sense of punishment, but in the sense of structure and order. Unrestricted chesed is as chaotic as an ice cream machine that you can't shut off. Right? You need structure. That's midas hadin. So, week number one, I try to be a kinder person. Week number two, I try to be a more disciplined person. Week number three, I try to balance my desire to give with my desire to focus and integrate. So to ferret, beauty is balancing the extremes. Too much chesed, like Avram, you get a Yishmael. Too much gavura, like Yitzchak, you get an Esav. Yaakov represents the Pharaoh. So that's the first triad. Giving, holding back with structure, balancing. Chesed, Gevurah, Teferet, often abbreviated Chagat. Chagat. Chesed, Gevurah, Teferet. But then there's a second triad that enters the picture. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The second triad is this. Even if I, as a person, have managed to balance chesed and gevurah, when am I outer-directed, when am I inner-directed, because I need to be inner-directed as well, and I've achieved a balance, I can still be defeated by external obstacles. The pressures of society, the demands of work, a non-supportive family. Netzach is the quality of endurance and victory in which external forces do not take you away from your mission. So the Sviros correlate to personalities. Avraham is chesed. So the first week is the week of Avraham. Right now I'm not dealing with the days and the weeks. I'm just looking at the weeks. Week number two is Yitzchak who focused on introspection and inner spiritual development. Week number three is Yaakov, who balances. We then get to the second triad of Netzach, not allowing the vicissitudes of life to take you away from your mission. That is the week of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe is Netzach. Moshe, in spite of the fact that he was the most humble of all people, he had a mission he had a difficult, rowdy group of three million people who tried to undermine him at every stage. But he had a job. He didn't allow himself to get discouraged. If I want to be a Netzach person, I'm asking God for the koach not to be broken by the difficulties I face in life. But you know, you need an antithesis. Because the same way, too much chesed, your kids uh, will lose their teeth. Too much netzach, you become a steamroller. I have my agenda, I have my avoda, I will roll over you. I want to wake up uh, every night for tikkun chatzos. I have a roommate or a spouse who will happen to be woken up and say, who cares? I got to do my thing. So you need a balance to Netzach, and that's Hod. If Netzach is full steam ahead no matter what, Hod is the receptivity to the other, stepping back. And that is Aaron. Oev Shalom. Verodev Shalom. The lover of peace. Aaron lived a life where other people would shine. The fact that he was a Navi before Moshe and he was willing and happy to give Moshe the leadership. And Aaron making peace between husband and wife. So too much Netzach, you're a steamroller. 
too much hot, you're a dish rag. Right? Aaron, Aaron made the ego. People wanted an ego. So, just as chesed and gevurah need a balance of teferet, netzach and hot need a balancing principle, which is called yesod, foundation. And that is symbolized by Yosef. You'll notice that we're not following chronology here. We have Moshe, Aaron, Yosef. Yosef was a person on one hand who had the quality of Netzach. He was sold into slavery. He was raised in a society. Or he was growing up in a society in his later adolescence and youth that was bereft of morality, that was corrupt, that was degenerate. And he remained firm in his mitzvahs and all that he learned from his father. And he rejected the temptation of Asius Potiphar. And he didn't lose hope throughout his imprisonment and his slavery. And when he became Mishnah Lamelech, the Nisayan is even greater. The Nisayan of power is even greater than the Nisayan of poverty. He's a Netzach person. He doesn't get broken. But we also know that Yosef had an extraordinary talent to be able to forgive others, including his brothers. And in fact, it's brought down that the reason why Yosef was such a successful administrator was because he made other people look good. This is actually one of the great management tools. You know, we have leaders who, are, when things go good, they take the credit. And when things go bad, somebody else gets the blame. A true leader works in the other direction. A true leader gives credit to others and acknowledges others, but takes responsibility when things don't work out well. Yosef is described as Ish Matzliach. Now the standard English translation of Ish Matzliach means a successful person. But grammatically, that's not right. Matzliach is one who makes other people successful. So Yesod is the balancing of Moshe and Aaron. Moshe, full steam ahead. Aaron, I step back. Oev shalom, v'rodev shalom. I let other people shine. Yesod is how you integrate it. And then the last of the spheros is Malchus, kingship. And when the Zohar describes what is Malchus, it says Malchus is an empty vessel. Malchus is simply the channel through which when God mixes all of these forces together in different colors and combinations, they enter the world through the conduit of Malchus. That's the revelation of God's kingdom. And that is symbolized by David HaMelech, who knew that everything came from God. David HaMelech's own life was not his own. Remember Adam HaRishon gave him 70 years. That's why Adam should have lived a thousand years. And Adam only lived 930 because he gave 70 years to David HaMelech. Right? These are the seven spheres. And they, 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 they apply in so many contexts. These are the seven Ushpizen of Sukkos. These are the seven Hakafos of both Hoshana Rabbah and Shemini Yetzeres. And they are the seven weeks of Sviras HaOmer. Different spiritual energies symbolized by personalities who exemplified the highest development of those particular spiritual energies. So now, let's plot Lagba Omer on our graph. Lagba Omer is the fifth week of the Omer. In fact, it's a little confusing because well, we, we count the fourth week, but we're in the fifth week right now. Uh, so, for example, Lagba Omer, what do we say tomorrow night? I could say it now because it's not Lagba Omer yet. Uh, we're going to say tomorrow night that this is the 33rd day, that is four weeks and five days. But it's a little confusing. That actually means we are five days in the fifth week. 
We've already finished four weeks. So Lagba Omer is the fifth day of the fifth week of the Omer. The fifth week of the Omer is Hod, glory. The fifth day of the Omer is Hod, Shebahod. The day of glory in the week of glory. It is a double dose of Aaron. The spiritual energy that comes into the world is Aaron squared. Now if Aaron's Mida represents seeing the good in people, letting them shine, appreciating their goodness, not trying to be domineering, then Lagba Omer was gifted, so to speak, with that spiritual aura. As a result, for at least that one day, the scales were lifted from the eyes of the Tamide Rabbi Akiva that they truly were able to see the greatness of the other. And since the whole reason for their deaths was their failure to perceive that greatness, the day they could perceive it would be the day that they would no longer die. Maybe it was temporary, maybe it was permanent, that depends on the Minhagim. But that explains why Lagba Omer the students of Rabbi Kiva didn't die because it was the day of Hod Shabahod, and that was the Tikkun, that was the rectification for Lainagu Kavait, for not having Kavait for each other. But then we also celebrate the greatness of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, in many ways, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, I think we mentioned this last week, represents an extreme connection to Torah that places him beyond the purview of everybody else. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai lived in a cave with his son for 12 years because he was fleeing the Roman persecution. In those 12 years, Hashem made springs of water and trees with fruit and the birds brought him meat. And all he focused on was Torah, mitzvos, Kabbalah, Devekos. Ad kach. That Rabbi Shimon Reuchoi actually took the halachic position. That you're not allowed to go to work. Rabbi Ishmael says, a oh, person should have a parnasa. Rabbi Shimon Reuchoi says, parnasa? What are you talking about? A person is going to plow when it's time to plow, plant when it's time to plant. When is he going to learn? And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai makes the astounding statement that if you simply say, I give up everything, I devote my life to God, God is going to take care of you. It worked for me, so he says. It'll work for you too. Now, the Gemara goes on to add, many tried to follow the path of Rabbi Yishmael and combine Torah with making a living, and God blessed them. And many people tried to follow the path of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and basically say, I'm not going to work, I'm not going to make any plan, God will take care of me, and they, they didn't do that well. So, in terms of normative halacha, we do follow the path of Rabbi Yishmael. Because we're not Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the epitome of being unconnected to the physicality of this world. Who needs it? Don't need to work. My life is with Hashem. So, in a sense, when we honor the stopping of the deaths of Rabbi Akiva's Talmidim, we're focusing on connecting to others. Avas Yisrael Achdus. When we celebrate Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we are celebrating passion and fiery devotion to truth. 
So what is fascinating here, and again, this point deserves further development, maybe I'll even make a fourth year on Sphira. What is fascinating is, in the polarized world that we live in, these two goals often contradict each other. You tend to find, again, Baruch Hashem, there are many exceptions, but you often tend to find the more passionate, the more fiery, the more consumed I am by Torah and mitzvot, the less patience and tolerance I can have for people who are not on my level. I can look down at them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want my kids to be connected to them. I make walls of separation. And then you have the opposite. You have people who are, they love all Jews, they're big tent Jews, everyone's good, everyone's wonderful. But they often might be mushy and compromising on truth. Ah, you believe abortion is fine, okay, you know, everyone has their opinion, transgender, gay marriage, whatever, whatever the issue would be. Which means, it's almost as if you gotta make a choice. Either you love people and don't stand for anything, or you're passionate and zealous, but you reject people who are not living by your standards. What Sevira Sa'omer generally, and what Lagba Omer in particular, is by combining these two ideas, it's saying, remember the Aron Aron of seeing the good in others and remember the passion of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to uncompromising truth. Grow in your Torah, grow in your mitzvahs, but don't let it be at the expense of your love and acceptance of others. Grow in your Avas Yisrael and your respect for others. But let it not be at the expense of your devotion to truth. Non, I'm using an expression from transgender, but it fits here. Uh, you got to be a non-binary person, not in the sense of transgender, but non-binary in which you shouldn't look at these pathways as mutually exclusive. You got to do both. And that, I think, is the lesson, ultimately, of Lag Baomer. We celebrate two very different things and two very different personalities because we have to integrate both of these ideas into our psyches. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu help us do that. And again, part of the key is to understand that if I'm passionately connected to Torah, Part of my passion should include the mitzvahs of Avas Yisrael. In other words, that should be my passion. And we think, I'm passionate about Torah, and therefore I can't care about people. Well, that's part of the Torah too, right? So let your passion be. I'm passionate about Avas Yisrael, about uh, Rachamim, about the looking at people favorably. That's part of my passion. Fold it into the zealousness. And then you're able to live without that contradiction that often exists. Okay, thank you, and uh, that's it for tonight.